Greetings, Takaho. We are HK Urbex, Hong Kong Exploring. We're going to do things a little bit differently today. This is not your conventional TED Talk, as you can tell. We need to keep our identities a bit uh, secret and not disclosed. There was a couple other people wearing masks. He doesn't have a flu, don't worry. He's, a, he's, he's not totally there, but he's sane enough, don't worry. So we're here to talk about Hong Kong exploring, HK Urbex. Yeah, so what is urbexing? Urbexing is a contraction of the term urban and exploration, um, adventure more often than they're not undertaken anonymously. <laughs> anonymously, yeah. The videos you are seeing are sites in Hong Kong that we have found. This has become a pastime. Um, I call it a fetish, really. I'm, I'm really attracted to abandoned sites in Hong Kong. And it really amazes me that in this city with almost 8 million people, a population, this overcrowded, dense, overpopulated, you know, there's hundreds of sites like this which are just unused, you know, unexplored, just left abandoned to nature. And nature is reclaiming these sites faster than man ever could. Now, um, some of these sites include military barracks, the shipwreck, as you saw just now. Uh, this is a psychiatric hospital, um, a little bit scary. Um, military barracks dating back to the British. All of these places have been undocumented. They're like not in the newspaper. It's really hard to find any history of them. And history is important to Hong Kong city, I think. Yeah, so you've all heard the cliches about Hong Kong. It's that mishmash between old and new or old and young, east and west, day and night, that kind of thing. And it's interesting that in the crossover, you'll find that um, there are many, or there's a myriad of locations that remain, as my teammate mentioned, untouched or undocumented. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the idea of urbexing being a form of escapism. So growing up in the 90s, um, I was a huge fan of point-and-click adventure games. Everything about the exploration, finding clues, solving puzzles, all this kind of thing. So you've got these games that were mainly made by uh, Sierra Online or LucasArts. So you've got your Gabriel Knights, your Quest for Glories, Monkey Island, things like this. And then through the natural evolution of this particular genre, you now have things like first-person exploration games, so Myst, Riven, Myst 3, or first-person survival horror, which is like Amnesia, The Dark Descent, or Alien Isolation. Um, now, just like any other game, um, you would walk out there with your inventory bag, with your little tools for your little quest, and you also have to capitalize on your researching and archiving skills to find maps and locations to build your itinerary. Now, the interesting thing about... Um, Sorry, excuse me. <laughs> the interesting thing about having these kind of locations in Hong Kong is it's not, it's, it's never been the kind of location where that ex you'd expect this kind of thing. All of my friends back in Australia or my friends in Canada or the UK, whatever it happens to be, they will tell me every time I put a new video up, I didn't, I didn't expect Hong Kong to be like this. I thought it was going to be some kind of Final Fantasy type futuristic city and all this kind of thing. Um, but yeah, so through the evolution of that, that particular genre type, I find that um, as an extension of the uh, sociology of boredom, if you will. Urbexing is the ultimate video game. You go out there, you explore, you are your own player, you play a character, hence the masks and all this kind of thing. Um, but one of the most important rules that we follow is leave nothing but footprints and take nothing but photographs. And there's an important reason for this. Um, about a year ago, we explored a empty, sorry, an abandoned mansion in Hong Kong that had been empty for about 50, 60 years. Um, which was inhabited by men members of the clergy. Now, one of, our <laughs> one of our members at the time decided to be a good idea to take uh, a church candle that was there. Very nicely designed, very ornate, very beautiful. But when he took this candle home, um, for the remainder of the evening, his child was... What's the word you want to Freak use? Freaking out. Yeah, freaking he out. He saw a presence. Just crying. Yeah. He saw a presence. So for the remainder of the evening, the, the, the child wouldn't calm down. And he kept on pointing at the candle. So the whole idea here is that you, you, you don't know what you're going to bring back. I'm not saying that there's anything there, but you know. Um, but yeah, so another story I'd like to quickly delve into is that we went down into a subterranean mine about a year ago. So this goes down about nine to 11 different levels. We went down two, and this took about 90 minutes. If we went any further, we would have found a lot more stuff, um, but we kind of only had a chance to look at the, I guess, files that have been left behind, some photographs, nothing really of interest. Um, but like a video game, you need to build that skill set so you can begin by doing abandoned houses, abandoned monuments and things like this, and build up to mines and stuff like that. So yeah, um, Chris Lonsdale earlier, he gave a nice talk. Thank you for that. And he was talking about how uh, our beliefs affect our reality. What we do, I guess, is really breaking that down to a whole nother level. He was talking about switching on and off switches. We kind of twist them 
huh, TEDx twisted, but we twist them to a whole nother level. Um, I, everybody interprets the city differently. When a woman walks down the street with her pram, she's negotiating the city in, social, in time and space. And she's thinking of a place, where can I change my baby's diaper? Where is the best pathway for my pram? When a policeman negotiates the city and when he walks around, he's also thinking about his m mental map of the city is differently. So our mental map is actually, in the last year I've explored these sites, now I always have like a sixth sense. I'm always looking for a new building or maybe that flat up there looks a little bit abandoned. That government piece of land over there, that, that could have a story behind it. And I've found so many interesting stories and history in Hong Kong, which as I said earlier, is just undocumented. So it's become kind of a thing for us now to document these places on, on our Facebook page, on social media, and you know, just tell the stories of, of the unknown history, you know, these, these remnants of these places. As you can see here, this, this is a psychiatric ward for children, I believe it or not. And that, that helmet there was a, was a pad for, you know, those crazy kids that bang their heads on the wall. But this place is not documented. It's, it's, it's amazing. Um, another story I would like to tell, he spoke about the mine. Um, I'm, I'm going to tell you a story about uh, uh, TV studios that I went into uh, way out in the New Territories. And massive TV studios, places close down, they find it's cheaper just to leave the land as it is than reappropriate the space and do something else with it. So I was in a screening room with a friend, pitch black, you can't see your hand in front of your face. And the building is abandoned, the five floors, and you know there's TV uh, reels everywhere, TV cameras broken. And then suddenly the building came alive, it started shaking, and I was like, Yo, what, what is going on? This is like some kind of, there's no such thing as ghosts, but there's some spirit messing with the building here, you know? In the end, it turned out there was a flash typhoon, you know, Hong Kong in summer, there was a big typhoon. And the windows were shaking, the foundations of the building were shaking, and there was rain and storm. But when we were in that black room, we had no idea what was going on. So this is why we urbex. It's for these visceral experiences of that everyday normal life cannot give you, sanitized life cannot give you. I mean, he talked about undead zombies. There's plenty of those in Hong Kong. Everyone's like in their, in their phone, in their phone zone, you know, virtual reality. And what we do is the antithesis to all that kind of selfie photography, rooftopping, whatever, which is like an exercise in vanity. I mean, I wanted to do a selfie on stage here, but someone took my idea, so I'm not gonna do it today. Um, but anyway, another story I would like to tell you why Urbex is important to heritage. Uh, this is an abattoir that we went into. We got caught at the end of this video. You can have a look. It's pretty funny. Security, you know, <laughs> things you have to deal with. But it's, it's a minor, it's a minor uh, thing that we get over. So heritage. Um, you all look like pretty intelligent people. You, I, ho I hope you've all been in Hong Kong for quite a long period of time. 1997 handover, things have been changing. There's been a lot of social unrest, especially last year, as you all know. Um, I've seen evidence of it around this university, which is awesome. Um, a big significant event in 2007, which led to the development of this social un unrest, was the closure of uh, Edinburgh Place Star Ferry Pier. This was the third uh, generation of the Star Ferry Pier. They had a clock, clock tower on there. And the clock tower was designed by a British architect. The rest of it was designed by a Chinese architect in the 1950s. So it's around 50 years old. 2007, the government decides to knock it down, demolish it. Did they tell anyone? Did they consult the public? No, they didn't. No, uh So there was a big um, long hair came out, all, all those kind of protesters, they stayed just sitting around it. 150,000 people turned out to take the last Star Ferry ride from there. You know, they, they, it, was, it was nostalgic. People, people, heritage is important to people, you know? But the government didn't consult or talk to anyone about this before it happened. So that was a big event that I believe led to it was one of the events. There's many, there's so many. You could go back if you want to talk about examples of why the social unrest in Hong Kong is currently where it is. But in conclusion, that, that clock tower, um, not conclusion, but that clock tower, um, the, the clock was actually the mechanics of it was designed by the same guy who did the mechanics for Big Ben. And the government just pulled that down. They didn't make efforts to preserve it. They didn't make efforts to put it in a museum. They didn't uh, rebuild it somewhere else. Uh, uh, Clock expert even came a year before it closed down and he said, hey, I can fix this clock, we can put it somewhere else. Government said, no, no, too expensive, too expensive. So they said, what we're going to do is in the new Star Ferry Pier, which if you go, you can hear it today, they have an electronic chime, which replicates and mimics what was there before. Nothing re like reality, you know. So heritage is important, you know, it, it, history is important. It, it tells us who we were, it tells us what we can do better in the future. You know, it helps us learn, it helps us teach our, our, our offspring about the ways that things were. And I think, you know, all these sites, there should be more efforts to preserve them and conserve them. I mean, 
this is why we, we are storytellers. This is what we do. We, we take photography and, and we document this for, for people. Yeah. Thank you for listening to our super brief TEDx. <laughs> if you want to see more of our stuff, you can check it out on Facebook, YouTube, or Vimeo. Thank you.